You've probably never heard of Charlie Gard. He's a terminally ill 10-month-old baby who has now been sentenced to death by the European Court on Human Rights, an Orwellian organization if ever there has been one, which determined that while his parents wanted to take him to the United States for a long-shot, potentially life-saving treatment, they couldn't. Instead, the court ruled, the great Ormond Street Hospital for Children would withdraw all life support, killing Charlie. What was the court's justification? Charlie had to quote-unquote die with dignity. You see, Charlie suffers from a mitochondrial disease that destroys the muscles in the brain. There was no available treatment in the United Kingdom, and so Charlie's parents, Chris Gard and Connie Yates, raised $1.6 million to fly him to the U.S. for an experimental treatment. But the hospital argued that the treatment wouldn't help Charlie and would prolong his suffering, and that they knew better than the parents who had to suffer through his illness and care for him every single day. Thus, the hospital argued that it would be in Charlie's best interest to die. UK courts agreed. The guards then appealed to the EU, and now the court has ruled against them, with the ECHR, that's the European Commission on Human Rights, stating, quote, Charlie would suffer significant harm if his present suffering was prolonged without any realistic prospect of improvement, and the experimental therapy would be of no effective benefit. The hospital issued its own perverse statement. They said, quote, our thoughts are with Charlie's parents on receipt of the news that we now know will be very distressing for them. Today's decision by the European Court of Human Rights marks the end of what has been a very difficult process. And our priority is to provide every possible support to Charlie's parents as we prepare for the next steps. Despite the hospital's statement that it would not immediately change the standard of care, his parents now report that the hospital will withdraw life support tomorrow. His parents announced, quote, We begged them to give us the weekend. Friends and family wanted to come and see Charlie for the last time, but now there isn't even time for that. Doctors said they would not rush to turn off his ventilator, but we are being rushed. Not only are we not allowed to take our son to an expert hospital to save his life, we also can't choose how or when our son dies. There are several levels to the perversity here. First, for all the talk of the evils of the American system of healthcare, at least we promote freedom of choice and give as many options to people for their care as they can afford. As the doctor who offered experimental treatment said in court, if Charlie had been ill at any institution in the United States, they would immediately have begun the treatment. But in the UK, a socialized medicine country where individual needs come second to the preservation of the system, there is less concern with parental rights. In the US, we are so interested in the freedom to obtain care that we insist on releasing a legally brain-dead girl to her mother so long as her mother wishes to keep her hooked up to a ventilator. In the UK, they are insistent on withdrawing the opportunity for life-saving care because it is better to kill the child than keep it alive. While this case became a court proceeding, every single day, the National Health Service, the NHS, makes decisions about how to ration care. Bernie Sanders tweets about how nobody should be denied care because they can't afford it, but that's what happens all the time under socialized medicine. The difference being, it's not about you not being able to afford it, it's about the government not being able to afford it. And you do not even have the capacity to raise the money to fund the care yourself. Second, a government-run system breeds a shift in control. In the U.S., the case of Charlie Gard is a major scandal. In the EU, it's apparently no big deal. That's because we in the United States like to think that we control our lives and that as parents, our priorities matter than those of random doctors who don't raise our kids. But once you give up control of your life and death decisions to an impersonal government, it is nearly impossible to take back that control. This case could have been easy. The hospital could have released the child back to the parents. The hospital didn't do it because it believed that it had the final say. And why shouldn't it? It always has the final say under the NHS system. Third, allowing the government to control the value of life means devaluing life. It has been a fundamental hallmark of Western civilization that life ought to be preserved in spite of pain, in spite of suffering, that death is not a solution to suffering. But that notion has now been stripped away in favor of a secularist standard of healthy living. And so in Europe, euthanasia is now available to people who aren't even terminal, people who suffer from depression or anorexia. Better to die with dignity than live with pain. That's the new math. That's a far cry from the original Hippocratic Oath, which overtly stated, neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course, or even the Tufts Medical School version, which is usually used in the United States, which states, quote, above all, I must not play at God. Those who value life want to keep choices about their life in their hands, rather than turning such control over to an impersonal government bureaucracy that guarantees you coverage it chooses for you. Charlie Gard's story isn't just a travesty of justice and an insult to decency. It's a warning for people who think that bureaucracies are as interested in preserving your health care as you are. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. It's just a heartbreaking story, and I want to talk a little bit more about the Charlie Gard story in a second. Plus, President Trump on Twitter again, saying stuff, CNN imploding. 
All sorts of fun coming up. But before we get to any of that, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Lyft. So right now, Lyft is looking for new drivers. And what makes Lyft fantastic for drivers is that you're allowed to tip in the app. When you drive for the right ride-sharing app, every trip feels great. And Lyft is that ride-sharing app. You can pick your own hours. You work when you want. Uh, They are the ride-sharing company that believes in treating their people really well, which means that if you're a customer, you're going to get the best drivers. Lyft believes that Being a ride-sharing driver should be fun. If you're choosing a ride-sharing company to drive for, go with the company that treats you well. They offer, as I say, in-app tipping. When you drive for Lyft, you keep 100% of the tips. Drivers have been paid over $150 million in tips since the feature was introduced. I ride with Lyft all the time. I talk to the people who drive. They are very happy, and uh, I've always felt the uh, I've I've always felt the spur to, to give them good tips because they're terrific people and great drivers. Lyft has even taken the guesswork out of pickups. Right now, they have an AMP device that uses color coding to help passengers find their drivers. You can earn hundreds of dollars a week if you're a driver over at Lyft, plus tips. If you want to make more money, you drive more. It's that simple. It's a simple formula, which is why 9 out of 10 Lyft rides get a perfect five-star rating because the drivers are happy. Right now, if you want to become a Lyft driver, go to lyft.com, L-Y-F-T dot com slash Shapiro today. That's lyft.com slash Shapiro, and you get a $500 new driver bonus right out of the gate. That's lyft.com slash Shapiro, lyft.com slash Shapiro. Limited time only. Terms apply. Again, Lyft, great ride-sharing app. We use it all the time in the Shapiro household, lift.com slash Shapiro. Okay, well, yeah, the, the life issue is near and dear to my heart, as you know, if you've watched the program at all or seen any of my videos on YouTube. I'm actually in Wisconsin right now broadcasting from the road uh, because I was the keynote speaker at the National Right to Life Convention, and there is a sickness that has taken hold on the left that suggests that life is not valuable unless it is up to your standard of what constitutes health and happiness, right? So, the, the idea here is that quality of life matters more than life itself, which is just asinine because the fact is quality of life changes over time. Just because somebody is suffering does not mean that their life is meaningless or valueless. This becomes particularly an issue when the person can't speak for themselves as with this as with this kid. As, as a sort of libertarian person, uh, I you know I morally don't believe in assisted suicide, but as a libertarian, I sort of understand the position at least, the notion that, that if you are terminally ill and you're going to die anyway, that you may want to pull the plug. It's not something I agree with morally, and I don't think that the government should be involved in sponsoring it. Um, But I certainly don't agree with the idea here, which is that if this baby was not going to have quality of life that you like, and you, I mean the court, if you don't like that quality of life, but the parents want to preserve the life, I don't see how you are able to trump their capacity to attempt to save their own child. It's just, it's just plain evil. And you can hear the suffering of the parents. Here's what The parents had to say just a couple of months ago about the government attempting to stop them from bringing... This is not even a matter of them asking the the NHS to cover the cost. They're saying, we'll cover the cost ourselves. Just give us back our kids so we can leave. And the NHS basically said, no, here is uh, is the the parents of this poor poor child. What what, what happens now? Well, we're going to try and appeal the decision. Just wanting to find out and where we can... Mm -hmm. Is there a time scale that, that you have to adhere to? To, to, to make today. that appeal. Yeah, it was three weeks, but it's uh, now kind of a week's passed and it's two weeks today. That must be very difficult, Chris, to get your head around doing anything like that when you must be feeling so devastated about what happened at the end of that court I still case. haven't got my head around it. It was a week ago and I'm still, you know, I can't sleep, I can't eat. Um, I still can't get my head around why we're not allowed to take our boy um, for treatment that he so desperately needs, you know. And just to get be just clear, Chris, you've raised money, you have funds, you could pay for the transportation to the United States, yeah? And you're prepared to do that. Yeah. The reason that the, that the judges decided that that should not be the case is that the medical opinion is that this would be too stressful and, and too painful for your son. Is that right? But that's what they're saying. That's not, we totally disagree with that. Um, he's probably the most kind of stable baby in there. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not in pain. He's not suffering because if he was suffering and he was in pain, we wouldn't sit by his bed and watch him suffer. So um, the harshness of all of this is partly that you're not asking for anyone else to pay for this, mm. right? So you're just being denied the physical transportation. Yeah. Okay, this is what is truly incredible about all of this, and this is why, again, there is a basic rift when it comes to the quote-unquote right to health care. People on the right say you have the right to obtain health care for which you are willing to pay, and that gives you the ability to make choices about your own health care. The left says 
you have the right to obtain health care regardless of ability to pay, but then says, okay, well, the people who are actually going to pay for you get to make the decisions. The bottom line is, in life, whoever controls the dollars makes the call. Okay, when it comes to your own health care, if you control the dollars, you make the call. And if the government controls the dollars, the government makes the call. And so in this particular case, you know, there have been situations like this in the United States, like Terry Schiavo, but even that was a little bit different because Schiavo was an adult and they were trying to figure out what her wishes would have been as an adult. In the United States, if you are, it was not a matter of willingness to pay or, or the people who obviously have control over the situation, the parents, making a case. What, what the guards are going through may be specific to their child, but socialized medicine is all about somebody else making a decision for you, how long you ought to wait in line for a surgery, what sort of treatment you ought to get, what sort of treatment is best for you. In the United States, we don't do that. So when people say you spend a lot of money, yeah, we spend a lot of money because we choose to spend a lot of that money, and that's okay. You know, I, we do a big ideas section at the end of the show now, and at the end of the, the show today, I'm going to talk about supply and demand in healthcare because I think people need to understand how this works. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But before we do that, the other big news of the day, because everything is stupid, is President Trump decides that it is imperative that he go off on Mika Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough. So as I mentioned yesterday, the only people who be- benefit from the media fight with Trump are the media and Trump. That's the, the American people don't benefit from this in any way. And because there's such a reactionary n- feeling on both sides, because Trump supporters are not well, at least a lot. A lot of Trump supporters are not even interested in forwarding his policy goals. They're more interested in him slapping the left. Whatever he does that slaps the left is seen as an ultimate good, even if it's actually counterproductive to pushing his agenda. And on the left, they're so the, the same exact thing. They're so interested in seeing the media slap Trump that it doesn't matter if it undermines their own credibility. At least they're slapping Trump, and Trump is mean and bad. So Mika Brzezinski was on with Joe Scarborough this morning, and she said something about Trump's tiny hands. She made some crack about Trump's tiny hands. Now, he's the most powerful man on planet Earth. He's one of the richest men on planet Earth. You would think that President Trump could handle, you know, somebody being mildly insulting or very insulting. I mean, this is part of the job. It's part of the gig. But President Trump then took to Twitter and he tweeted out, quote, and this is a direct quote from his Twitter. This is the president of the United States, not Donald Trump candidate, not Donald Trump reality star, the most powerful man on planet Earth and a job that used to, you know, we on the right used to say, why isn't Barack Obama wearing his jacket in the Oval Office? Why is he putting his shoes on the desk in the Oval Office? Okay, this is the guy in the Oval Office now, quote, I heard poorly rated Morning Joe speaks badly of me. Don't watch anymore. Then, how come how come low IQ crazy Mika, along with Psycho Joe, came to Mar-a-Lago three nights in a row around New Year's Eve and insisted on joining me? She was bleeding badly from a facelift. I said no. Okay, first of all, terrible story, dude. I mean, like, that's a really crappy story, but... So there, there are a bunch of people on the right who find this just absolutely hysterically funny because it's funny anytime anybody on the left gets slapped, even if this is just the Three Stooges and it's Larry Curley and Mo pulling each other's hair and poking each other in the eyes. Uh, I'm th- This isn't my favorite Trump insult. Trump has, has had insults that I think are, are much better than this. Uh, he has a very short thesaurus of insults. Low IQ, crazy, psycho, low energy, short, you know, like he has a kind of this, this, it's like 11 insults and he just rotates them. Um, but in any case, people were going after Trump and they're very upset with Trump because Trump was talking about her bleeding from her facelift, which is utterly irrelevant to any of this stuff. And now to be fair, to be fair, as I say, uh, it is true that the, that, um, the, it is true that the media have been targeting Trump. It is fair that it is true that, that Mika Brzezinski was going after uh, President Trump on his appearance, on, on his hands. And so it's not totally unfair for him to strike back, except for the fact that she's a news commentator and he's the president of the United States. Now, on the right, I think people on the left have to understand why people on the right respond to Trump by basically poo-pooing some of this stuff. Not because it's right, because it isn't right, okay? I don't think this should be poo-pooed. I think it's stupid. I think when the right poo-poos this kind of stuff, they're actually undercutting their own credibility. There's not a single person in America who thinks less of Mika Brzezinski because Donald Trump tweeted about her facelift. Okay, no one who is not already in Trump's camp cares about that sort of stuff. But, both the, again, when you talk about the polarization in the country right now, people on the right view Trump's shtick. People on the right view Trump's shtick the same way that people on the left view Samantha Bee. So Samantha Bee is utterly unfunny. If you're on the right and you watch Samantha Bee, you think, how does this woman make a living? She is just awful. She's gauche and nasty and vulgar, and the left just swoons for her. They love her. Why? Because it's not that she has to tell the truth. She doesn't. She just has to slap Trump. So here's an example. She's slapping Paul Ryan last night on, on her show. I mean, this is vulgar and crude, and the left celebrates this kind of stuff all the time. 
Most people like Medicaid, including Republican people. Who the hell asked you to gut it by sending it to the states and capping its growth rate? Medicaid, sending it back to the states, capping its growth rate. We've been dreaming of this since I've been around, since you and I were, were, were drinking at a keg. I was, I, I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, while most college guys in the 90s were fantasizing about Pamela Anderson, Paul Ryan was jerking it to thoughts of poor people losing health care to pay for taxes. Ha 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 Okay, and so then the left loses it. Oh, yeah, Samantha B. she's the best. She's so fun. Okay, so Samantha B. is basically to insult comedy what Trump is to insult comedy on the right. Now, the difference is that Trump is the president of the United States. He is not a comic on late night TV. And I know that the right is finding it amusing that Trump is playing the comic on late night TV, but it's not actually making his agenda any more effective. It's giving the left a reason to bat him around. And it is plainly rather immoral for the president of the United States to be tweeting about people's bloody facelift in order to humiliate them because they don't like him in the media. It's just not a good thing to do. I mean, is it fair to say that that's not a good thing to do? Are we allowed to say that anymore? Nonetheless, because everybody, it, it's now a slap fight, okay? All of politics is a slap fight. The cause, you know, I used to stand for the cause. The cause was things like pro-life. The cause was things like lower taxes and smaller government and less regulation and more power over your own life. That was the cause. Now the cause is everybody slapping each other like Kramer and, and like, like Seinfeld and, and Costanza. On, I mean, it's, they're just sitting around. It's like Napoleon Dynamite having a slap fight. Ooh, Napoleon Dynamite got in a slap. That's what it is now. And you can hear the glee, right? I mean, so Sarah Huckabee Sanders goes out there in the media and she says, well, of course Trump said this because he always slaps back. He's got to slap back. I mean, what do you want him not to slap people? Come on. Look, I, I don't think that the president's ever been someone who gets attacked and doesn't push back. Uh, there have been an outrageous number of personal attacks, not just to him, but to, frankly, everyone around him. Uh, people on that show have personally attacked me many times. This is a president who fights fire with fire and certainly will not be allowed to be bullied by liberal media and the liberal elites within the media or Hollywood or anywhere else. No, I get it, but... Okay, this is the routine. But 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 fight, but he fights. But he fights. Maga 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 maga. But he fights. Maga. Okay. Here's the deal, folks. Would you like him to be a successful president or not? Because I fail to see how him talking about Mika Brzezinski's facelift does anything to establish a border wall or Obamacare repeal or tax reform. This doesn't like some of Trump's attacks are useful. Like when he attacks CNN for promoting fake news, and they're actually promoting fake news. That is good. That is useful. I am a big fan of evidence-based insults, okay? So if you're going to insult someone, you have to have some evidence to back it up. And the evidence has to go to the issue at hand, okay? It, it, like, if you're having an argument about politics and then you just say about somebody, well, you're fat, this is not helpful and it doesn't forward your agenda in any way. It just looks petty and silly and ridiculous. And that's why the media is going nuts and they're having fun with this whole thing today and calling him a sexist. The right is saying, yeah, Trump was mean to Brzezinski. Who the hell cares about Mika Brzezinski except for Donald Trump? Nobody watches that show. Nobody, realistically speaking, watches that much cable news. Get the highest ranked cable news shows. Get like 2 million viewers a night. Okay, there are 330 million people in the country. And yet, and, and we're supposed to think that this is the form of winning, is, is slapping Mika Brzezinski over her facelift. I mean, like, really? Really? It's just a waste of time. Now, again, on the, on the left side of the aisle, they're trying to use this to, to give themselves the moral high ground, and they don't deserve the moral high ground because they're slapping Trump every chance they get in exactly the same way. They're just going out and, and using the stupidest possible reasons to, to slap Trump and making things up. I mean, th this is amazing. So CNN did an entire segment a couple of nights ago talking about refugee children from Syria and having Elmo explain it. Right. I mean, yes. No, there's no there's no media bias, Virginia. Elmo just regularly appears on CNN to explain the issues of the day. Here's tape of that. Elmo, can I just start by asking you, because I know you went to visit a refugee camp in Jordan, right? Yes. Back in February? Yes. What was it like? It was really wonderful. Oh, Elmo and Miss Shelley we went did. to Jordan together? We did. And Indeed. it was really wonderful, because Elmo got to meet a lot of new friends. A lot of new friends? And did you find that the Syrian little girls and little boys were a lot like your friends here in America? Yeah, they really were. It was very interesting, because they like to play and learn, right. just like Elmo and all of his friends at Sesame Street. And they loved Elmo. They loved meeting Elmo. Oh, my God. And then you wonder why we think there's media bias. So CNN is trying to restore its credibility. Here is a headline that CNN ran yesterday. Okay, there's an actual headline that they ran yesterday. Obama's genes game gets stronger. 
Yes, really. That's a headline that they wrote. So while they're busy doing all of this useless crap and then proclaiming themselves the most important people on earth for checking the president of the United States, and then Trump slaps them back with crap about facelifts, all of this is stupid. All of this is distraction. Now, the right is, there's some people on the right who are using this as an excuse to to kill CNN, right? So Sean Hannity is leading the charge on this. He says, it's time to put CNN underground. We're going to kill CNN finally. We're going to kill the beast. Here we go. But first, let me explain how one of the biggest anti-Trump networks has lost all their credibility and can no longer be trusted by you, the American people. Now, at this point, we should put CNN, six feet, you see right there, underground for repeatedly spreading lies, propaganda, black helicopter, tinfoil hat conspiracy theories, and for viciously trying to take down this president. Now, let's just look at some of the network's many controversies and scandals. Okay. Now, it's true. I've talked, I've talked as much as Sean has about CNN's bias. CNN is wildly biased to the left. When Sean does this routine where he acts as though CNN only became biased in the last five minutes, so only now have they destroyed their credibility. They've been destroying their credibility for years. Again, you can find tape of me on YouTube saying that they were basically a propaganda outlet for Hamas during the Gaza war three years ago. So this is nothing new. I mean, this has been happening my entire adult life at the very least. But there's a sort of opportunism where Sean is saying, okay, let's use this opportunity to put CNN underground and we'll just, and, and we'll just throw away whatever news they report at the same time. Again, is any of this designed toward getting at the truth? Or is this more designed at partisan bickering and let's take out our political opposition? That matters because if it's designed to get at the truth, then it's worthwhile. You know, debunking media bias is useful if you're attempting to get at the truth. Debunking media, because the entire media outlet, because you hate them and want them to lose, that's a slightly different thing. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about that, and I want to talk about the media's insane response to all of this. But first, I want to say thank you to our friends over at Birch Gold. So, you should definitely have part of your portfolio in precious metals. There is risk of inflation. There is risk of disaster, natural disaster that affects monetary supply. Uh, there's risk of economic collapse. There's risk of stock market. You should always have part of your assets in something solid like precious metals. And that's where my friends at Birch Gold Group come in. They have a longstanding track record of continued success, thousands of satisfied clients, countless five-star reviews, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Right now, gold has been doing really well in the market. Actually, I think it's been rising for five or six months now. Uh, if you contact Birch Gold Group right now to request a free information kit on physical precious metals, they will send you a 16-page kit on how gold and silver can protect your savings and how you can legally move your IRA or 401k out of stocks and bonds into a precious metals IRA. To get that kit, go to birchgold.com slash Ben. That is birchgold.com slash Ben. Ask all your questions, get all your answers, and then when you're ready to invest in precious metals, talk to my friends over at Birch Gold. Again, that's birchgold.com slash Ben. Use the slash Ben so that they know that we sent you. Okay, so the media have responded to CNN has responded to Trump being anti-media and then to Hannity being anti-media by doing what they do best, playing the victim. So one of the most irritating facts about the way that Trump and the media play off each other is the media claim they're the victim, so we're justified in slapping Trump. And then Trump and Sarah Huckabee Sanders say Trump is the victim, and so they're justified in slapping Mika across her face-lifted head or whatever. So Brian Stelter yesterday on CNN, he said that anti-journalist rhetoric is on the rise and people are going to die. I told you a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, okay, when there was that shooting in Virginia by a Bernie Sanders supporting loon bag who hated Donald Trump, I said, be very careful that you don't start labeling all rhetoric you don't like potentially violence provoking because the left will use that logic. Maybe they will anyway, but you can at least argue honestly against it if you don't use it yourself. Don't use the logic that rhetoric causes violence unless there's an open call for violence because otherwise you are just basically trying to rule out all rhetoric. Whatever I think about Trump's stupid tweets, I don't think that they are causing violence against journalists, but that's not what Stelter is saying. He says, people on the left, right, and in between who are pro-journalism recognize that most journalists try to be fair and right. And then he continues, but there's an alternative view, popular and partisan websites and social media that is straight up anti-journalism. These activists and commentators don't promote accountability. They promote resentment and hatred. Some of this anti-journalism spin isn't about eradicating bias or improving news coverage. It's about trying to stamp out reporting altogether. So I generally disagree with this. I, I think most of the people who comment on media bias are not attempting to stamp out the media altogether. But there is a grain of truth to the idea that if you spend time promoting the Seth Rich conspiracy and then you turn around and you say CNN has to be put six feet under because they are all fake news, are you a truth teller or are you just somebody who's attempting to play a partisan game? Now, the left uses that kernel of truth that there are some people on the right 
who are more anti, just anti all journalistic outlets that ever say anything bad about Trump, they're trying to use that grain of truth and turn that into there's a real threat to us. Okay, there is no real threat to the press. There isn't. Okay, this is not to say there couldn't be a nut job out there who is inflamed and goes and shoots a, a journalist, but this is true in political rhetoric all the time. I mean, there's a reason I travel with security. But the, what the left is trying to do is they're trying to say, we are on the verge because we covered Trump badly. And then Trump is mean to us. And then Trump says nasty things about us. We are on the verge of a fascist takeover here in the United States. So Chris Hayes at MSNBC, he puts on the Rachel Maddow glasses and he says Trump is going to quash the press. That's the next thing. It's going to quash the press. Okay, just to break that down for a moment. First, Amazon does not own the Washington Post. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos does. Second, there are no internet taxes. Amazon is now, however, collecting state sales tax nationwide. But President Trump's tweet goes beyond attacking the Washington Post as fake news, something he did as recently as yesterday. The president is very explicitly linking a complaint about a media entity to a threat, or at least implied threat, against the corporation associated with it. He did this as a candidate, too. During an October speech, he followed up a string of complaints about the media with this. Amazon, which through its ownership controls the Washington Post, should be paying massive taxes. Okay, so we talked about this yesterday and we talked about how silly this was, but Trump is not actually quashing the press. There has been no active move by President Trump to do anything remotely resembling quashing the press. He's limited press access in ways that Obama limited. Maybe he's done it a little bit more, and that's not good. I've criticized it, but this idea that the, the First Amendment is under siege, that the press are all at threat of some sort of grand government crackdown, haven't seen one shred of that. In fact, they seem pretty loud to me. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and what the left is trying to do in building this narrative, um, but for that, you're going to have to go over to dailywire.com become a subscriber. For $8 a month, you too can be a subscriber to dailywire.com. It means you get the rest of the show live. You get to be part of the mailbag, which we'll be doing tomorrow. We do live questions on the mailbag as well. You can be part of Andrew Clavin's podcast, be part of his mailbag too. So lots of good stuff happening over at Daily Wire. Right now, if you become an annual subscriber, you get a free signed copy of the book that I wrote with my dad about the Chicago White Sox and baseball and fatherhood and being a son. Uh, it's a really fun, it's called Say It So, free signed copy when you become an annual subscriber. Also, become annual right now uh, and uh, lock in that rate because once we hit July 10th, the rates are about to go up, uh, not on people who are already subscribed, but on new subscribers. So if you're thinking about subscribing and you think maybe you'll do it in three weeks, do it now, lock in your lower rate and get the benefit. Or if you just want to listen later, go over to iTunes or SoundCloud, subscribe, leave us a review. We always appreciate it. We are the largest conservative podcast in the nation.